but it's about 20% of the guys or less are getting 80% plus of the matches. Because when I've talked to some people, they say, oh, I was in this toxic relationship. I'm like, how long were you in that for? They're like two, three years. I'm like, wh how, why are you in it for so long? They've always had masculine guidance to, to choose a good man. Because when you're young, like, what do you, what do you know? Back in the day, like, as a guy, you would choose a woman and you would introduce her to your mother and your mother would say yes or no. Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Point Podcast. Today, we are here with Kit. Kit, I don't know what your surname is. Uh, it's a road show. <laughs> Imagine you're saying it's a road show, like a show on the road. Okay, yeah, nice. Kit, it's a road, it's a, it's a road show. What a great surname. It's nearly as cool as your Instagram handle which is what's your instagram handle i was i was i memorized it and now i've forgotten what it was Blay stay slick with kit what a great what a great um um what a great instagram handle and kit is a well, i don't know what would you what would you describe yourself as kit what are you setting out to achieve on instagram yeah sure so um i mean Primarily, I'm a I'm an award winning actor, so I'm an actor primarily. Um, but now I've I've really delved into the dating coach. I'm a male dating coach. They they call me London's Hitch. Apparently, that's the nickname they gave me. Wow. Um, I didn't choose it, but now it's stuck. So it is what it is. Not a bad nickname. Yeah. So let's let's talk about just briefly. We'll just talk about acting because I mean, that's really interesting. Uh, where did how long were you acting for, and where did you where did you act? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I've been I started theatre training when I was thirteen, uh, and then from there I went to somewhere called Tring Park, and then I went to a drama school called Mountview, and I trained in musical theatre. Um, so I've done shows in the West End, like Showboat, Original West End Cast of Tina, uh, Spring Lake, Spring Awakening, West Side Story, <clears throat> West Side Story. I uh, did most recently I did Bonnie and Clyde, which was last year. Um, and I've done voiceovers as well for blockbusters. I just did voiceover for Baldur's Gate 3. Um, and then uh, I won the Best Actor Award for one of my films last year. And then I star in two films coming out later on this year. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of kept me busy, you know, which is, you know, have a, I've had a very blessed journey with that, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and then the, the YouTube kind of dating culture thing kind of started it maybe five, five six years ago. Um, I just started putting out content online, you know, as a hobby because I've always had male and female friends come to me for dating advice. Um, and then I started to get a lot of traction and then people started messaging me saying, hey, I really love your content. It really helps me. Or can you start, can you help me through this situation? So then I started coaching people um, and now it's, you know, now it's kind of really grown. So I was on the BBC several months ago. Uh, you know, I get asked to kind of host certain dating events and stuff like that. Um, you know, and I kind of, the guests that I have on my podcast as well, you know, it's, they kind of semi high profile people and it's just growing and yeah, as we just want to have these honest, honest, open conversations, you know, that are very relatable to everybody and, you know, help people find the connection that they're looking for. You know, I think, well, at least my opinion, I think connection is what enriches life for us all. So, yeah. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. There's a, it's kind of a bit of a over, what would you say, referenced book to this degree but there's still truth in it there's still relevance to it there's a the thing that's called lost connections by quite old it's relatively old now it was sort of i'm not sure what the guy's called but um he was kind of writing a book about he traveled the world and he was sort of trying to look at the, the similarities and the i suppose the differences between like the rise of addiction and the possible lack of connection and and what the whole sort of phenomenon is and what and what's going on and i think he kind of reached the reached the conclusion that addiction is some form of sort of it's a it's a cover-up or it's a it's a it's a bad actor it's a lesser version of a true connection and i, I think that's i think there's a lot of yeah. logic behind that and it makes empirical sense and it makes uh what would you say sort of uh, lived experience sense as well you know you can see that in people who are addicted it's like yeah well you're lacking this and this and this in your life maybe so yeah, yeah it's a it's, you know, for a lot of people I think it's a coping mechanism for something that they feel they lack yeah a lot of yeah. the time yeah exactly that's a good way of putting it that's what I was trying to get to coping mechanism so when you say that people came to you 
and they were asking you for dating advice. Why do you think that is? Uh, I think because in today's world, you know, the world has changed compared to 30, 40 years ago um, in ways that are, that have been amazing. Um, but it also comes with its own challenges. Uh, and nothing is, nothing is ever all good. There's always, there's always trade-offs to it. Mm. And so because things have become more digitalized, you know, we don't live in a, um, we don't, <clears throat> we don't live in a local, for example, dating, no, uh, environment, right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the day, you would, you would choose somebody from your village, you know, from your small town or your small village. <clears throat> now we live in a globalized data market. So you can, you know, you can match with somebody in LA, you can match with somebody in Austria, you can match with somebody in Australia. Um, and while that has given people at least a level of perceived abundance and a lot of opportunity, it also has made it much more difficult to find genuine connection and a real relationship. And so I think the reason people have ended up coming to me when they do is because they want a real relationship, they want a real connection, and that you know they want someone to build a life with. Um, and they're just while it seems like it's there's a lot of opportunity. It's just not amounting to anything, um, and it comes with its own you you know best practices and I don't I, I don't want to say rules but m more effective ways to attract that kind of energy into your life, especially you know utilizing the tools that. Yeah, we're, we're becoming you use the word opportunity, with sort of freedom as well. the The idea that we have that freedom is an entirely sort of untrammeled. Uh, non-negotiable positive isn't yeah. actually accurate like people can become paralyzed by too much freedom and it can be actually become exceptionally like corrosive and almost ruin y your life because you're just surrounded by complete and utter chaos if you push freedom to it that's fundamentally another way of sort of articulating freedom and it it's and and it's particularly for like you use the analogy of you can match with people in like LA and Aust Austria. You've, you've got dating apps now that facilitate that. So like Tinder's got the, the global feature, hasn't it? And to what, if, if an app was truly designed to get people into, not even to get them into committed relationships, if an app was truly sort of designed to get people meeting one another in real life, then why would you create, why would you create a feature that does that? And obviously it's because the priority of these apps is to get people to use them as opposed to, that's, that's, a, that's it's at the top of the hierarchy, is to get people to use them. And then below that is to get, I suppose, the, the purpose of the app is second, it's, it's sort of secondary to getting people to use the app. Do, do you agree with that? Do you get what I mean? I, I do get what you mean. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I understand that these companies, they're a business. Yep. And so the definition of business is literally means in the pursuit of profit. That's, mm -hmm. that's what business means, right? Um, I, don't, I don't think that at least starting out, it, they were intentionally trying to keep no. people on the app for their own business. I think they're like, oh, there's a gap in the market and we can help that. But I think ultimately, ultimately a dating app is kind of like, it's kind of like your eating habits or going to the gym. How good or bad it is, is really dependent on how you, the person uses it. Now, it's one of those things where because of what's encouraged on the dating app, these illusion of options, most people fall into the trap that thinking that they have an abundance of options and they don't. And that's what the dating apps don't explain. And so that's why I think that's why people keep going back to it. I, they get that dopamine here. Also, there is the dopamine hit of the second you match with someone, especially someone you find attractive, you get that instant dopamine hit, right? So then it's like people aren't, half the time, people don't go on the dating apps to actually meet someone. They go on because it makes them feel good. Absolutely. You know, when they get those matches. And so it's one of those things where if someone said, okay, look, you can go and walk in the park and, you know, walk in the sun and then get an ice cream, or you can go to the gym and sweat it out for the next hour, it's like most people are going to choose the first one because that's what's going to make them feel good. Mm. But actually, if they're like, well, 
I have fitness goals to reach within the next three months. Really, you need to be going to the gym, you know, and you, you need to kind of sweat it out for an hour. And so it's um, ultimately, and that's not saying you can't, there can't be days where you do go out and walk in the sun and do have yourself an ice cream. Do you know what I mean? Over going to the gym. But ultimately, I think with power comes responsibility. And we've been given a lot of power to use who we give the uh, opportunity to. And people haven't learned how to use that power responsibly in a way that serves them. Yes, no, exactly. And it's you you spoke about the the sort of dopamine and the the attention sort of gratification behavior is is indicative of this sort of uh i suppose phenomenon that crops up all the time which is when you create something you don't just create that specific thing you that has an a sort of a knock on effect of all these sorts of things so people and and Every time you do something in life, it's impossible to consider all possible implications, pretty much. So these people, and I suppose the more, the grander the invention, the more of a knock-on effect it tends to have. So who who would have known that we'd get to a point where 10% of men on dating apps receive 90% of attention and 90% of them receive basically no attention. I mean, you probably could have predicted that because there actually is already evidence out there that that does point to the way that the world works. But yeah, that's uh it's called uh it's called the Pareto principle. Yep. You know. So for the, for anyone who doesn't know, when you have a free market, right? When you have them should know. know. Yeah, if you should know. Um but when you have a free market uh, where everyone has, when people have the same freedoms and opportunities, what ends up happening is you have 20% of mass is responsible for 80%, 80% of production. Yeah. So, And this manifests itself in so many ways in our world and universe. So, for example, in our galaxy, 20% of stars hold 80% of the galaxy's mass. In the world, 20% of cities hold 80% of the world's population. Mm. 20% of people in the world hold 80% of the world's wealth. If you're watching this and you're in a Western country, you're included in that 20%, right? 20% of authors are responsible for 80% of books sold. 20% of actors get 80% of the jobs. That's why we see the same actors in all these different things, right? And so what happened, what's happened over the past decade is that dating has now become a free market. And so what naturally happens, the Pareto Principle naturally is going to occur where you get okay well 20 percent is probably less than 20 percent, but it's about 20 percent of the guys or less are getting 80 percent plus of the matches and that you know that's 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 a consequence of having a, a free market essentially yeah and i i think you brilliantly i'm so glad that i mean every the fact that that isn't taught in like every single like university degree almost so to speak or you know is not taught in any social science, which is exactly where it needs to be taught. Because you you sort of touched on something brilliant is that people often, if you look at from a political perspective, people often look at something like capitalism and say, well, capitalism's wrong because it makes a few percentage of people really rich. And and obviously there's truth to that. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that that inequity, inequity almost isn't an example of capitalism it's just what would you say it's it's indicative of like it's almost like a law of the universe isn't it it's like a universal law um i don't know if it is it a universal law but it should be a universal law because it's i'm, I'm sure it's it should, 20 percent of oceans probably hold 80 percent of all the water and the the 20 percent of trees are taller than you know etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean I, even if you look at like a supermarket 20 percent of the products are bought by 80 percent of the people you know there's probably there's products in there that maybe i'm obviously not one person a year buys because they, they wouldn't be there anymore but like not many people buy and then there's products where that continuously being replenished because so many people are, are buying them and it's yeah it's, no, it, it's true even if even if someone's in business 
Like yes. any any good business owner knows, right? When they have a company and, you know, let's say for example in sales, you have your top performers. Your top performers bring in 80% of your revenue. Yes. Mm. It's just a nat- it's just a thing that naturally occurs. So, yeah, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to, you know, inequities, right? Now there's so many factors that can come yes. to you know certain inequities right there are always so many factors and you know the nice the 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 unfortunate reality is nobody is we all start with different cards in our hands mm. right we all start with different cards in our hands and that's just just the, the nature of the world yeah um so while we can acknowledge these inequities what we there has to be a balance of making sure that because this isn't about okay, what naturally happens is always right. It's about okay, what what's the best way to move forward that serves people as best as it can. And so, while we want to have a free market, of course, that allows people the opportunity to succeed, the society also becomes destabilized when all the riches go to the top as well. Yeah, and then actually, society just kind of collapses on itself. Yeah. So, it's about. <clears throat> It's about how do you encourage people to grow in themselves and inspire them to step up there? Because ultimately, if you become that person, right, that's because you you provide incredible value to society in which we all benefit. From, yeah. Right. At the same time, there has to be something where it still it doesn't destabilize people who maybe aren't people, especially in the bottom half. Because ultimately, they are the underbelly and the foundation of society in mm. terms of, you know, like, if we're talking economically, you know, it, like the working class or, you know, like the person who delivers your parcels or the person who cleans this, whatever, like those, those are the foundation, those people, especially construction workers, my mm. goodness, like their jobs is unbelievable, Yeah, you know. Um, so yeah, it's about getting the balance and, you know, we might get into this, but it's, it's it's the masculine and feminine, right? The masculine is order and the mas- uh, the feminine is chaos. And there's no good or bad. Too much order and you have complete tyranny, right? That's like Kim Jong-un, right? That's like Russia, right? It's just tyranny. But too much freedom for chaos is destabilization. Yes. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. In, um, yeah, it's in, in, in the Bible there's a great i'm not sure sort of if you're if you're religious but when moses leads the jews away from the tyranny of the pharaoh they don't immediately reach the promised land they leave the tyranny then they enter the desert and that's an example of what so uh, there's so much obviously societal culture sort of diatribe against like men and masculinity etc and the oppressive patriarchy and and all that and it it's and there's truth to that because structures and hierarchies do can de what would you say um derail into uh oppression and control and corruption i think corruption is the key word and there's actually there's truth to that and that needs to be effectively tempered and controlled in a society both from a top-down way and from a a, from a bottom-up way but the idea that it should just be all ripped to pieces and ripped to shreds and and just be you know we can rebuild in a in a better way in a sort of utopian um i guess marxism was is was the idea before that before we've got to where we are now is a very naive a point of view and just going back to the story because that's why i started in um they end up in the desert and basically it's sort of the point of that story is to show that once you leave the tyranny you don't reach the promised land you go into the desert and that's what you were explaining here that's what you were talking about the chaos and then you can work it you can work in theory, I mean, work through is a very, very um, inaccurate way of saying it. There's far more to it. But you could possibly eventually reach a promised land. And that's relevant in so many aspects of life. If you're in a toxic relationship, why why don't, why don't doesn't someone leave a toxic relationship? Well, it's because they do find partial safety and security 
in that relationship but apparently some of the the moses's sort of followers said to him yeah you know that like slave that you know the sort of the way we used to live let's actually go back there because this is actually that was actually better than us being in the desert because we really don't know what we're doing here and we have no idea where we're going and 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 that's and it's the same with ideas why do people hold on to ideas that they know are corrosive to them it's because you 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 can't really just let go of a controlling idea and then something beneficial take its place immediately like that and you're like oh cool i don't even know why i was thinking like that because now i'm okay it isn't that it, you it's like an, an ego death i guess is another way of putting it you're if you are thrown or dropped probably is a better way of putting it into this world of chaos and you have to claw your way out so yeah i really like the way that you were you, you spoke about that very clearly and, and and very well um what were we talking about before i went on my little rant i mean so we're talking about the free market of dating and now oh yeah guys, three, the free market dating yeah, yeah yeah yes no exactly um yeah, and, and I like the way you spoke about actors, and, and it's the same with like singers and Spotify. I think it's even pr- more pronounced than 2080. I think it's, it might have been m- me 90, 10, but you made a very, very good point where you, you said the answer isn't to cut off, the answer isn't necessary to cut off those people at the top, but it's to promote people at the bottom to try and move forward. I think that, yeah. that's absolutely spot on. Um, I'm a big football fan and we're seeing the the inflation in prices I don't know if you're if you like football but say you've got someone like Haaland Erling Haaland who's earning 400,000 pounds or probably more I think it might it might be earning around like 900 pounds a million pounds a week once he gets bonuses and stuff like that and obviously that creates an inflation because Manchester City is run by by a country basically effectively they're owned by country they have limitless money but league two you know barnsley can't compete with that level of inflation so when people were talking about do we bring in a wage cap and it was like do players can't earn over such and there's a very that's a very valid point like is does there need to be a wage gap does there need to be some sort of um top down controlling of things when they go out of when they basically reach an untouchable they're so far like no one can the other teams cannot compete with the wages that man city are playing but paying but what you said you made a very good point you said or, or maybe i'm i'm inferring it the, the, the point is is what damage might that do to the whole structure if you sort of um diminish or you cap the ideal because as you said you could someone could become could move towards being that person and then they should it's like the political sort of right versus left the people that are doing well should be rewarded but there needs to be places there needs to be sort of structures in place that mean that they're not being rewarded for corrupt behavior but also the people that lack also need to be taken care of and how do you create that balance so i guess from a, a dating perspective how do you think you could create that balance a bit more that's a very hard question so how how like in the current the current climate yeah the current, the great... current climate is it based my answer is okay no uh, yeah what, what what do you think okay so the idea is to because essentially it's part of okay I don't think it's going to happen, but here's how you would do it. Okay. Uh, This is what comes to mind. Good. Give it. If it became illegal to have sex outside of marriage, that would solve the the problem. Yes, it would, wouldn't it? Yeah. And the reason I say that is because what you want a free market so people can become what they want to become. But how you get the balance is you have to find an ethical way to redistribute the opportunities and the 
I don't say benefit, but the proceeds, right? That gives the others a chance. So what I mean is this. If you take if you take ten random men and ten random women and you put them on a deserted island, chances are seven or eight of those women will want the same two or three men. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's just what happens. Now, if you take it for example, now why, why, what, what's the, what's the thing that men primarily pursue in women? It's sexual opportunity, right? And we know that guys can be physical with multiple women and not get emotions attached. So, if you have two or three guys and you live in a completely free, sexual encouraged environment, those two or three guys will be sleeping with seven or eight of those women. Because why not? Because women are getting at least part of the guy that they want and the guys are getting the sexual access that they want and they get variety, which is something that we know typically males enjoy, right? So then what ends up happening is you have seven or eight of the guys fighting for two or three of the women. But then no one's actually satisfied because the two or three women, maybe they get a, you know, they get a guy that they want but the seven or eight women who are indulging sexually with the two or three guys, they're not getting the commitment, so they're not satisfied. No. And the rest of the guys miss out because they don't even get an opportunity with the other women. So the only person who wins is the guys who are at the top, which is what's happening now. But do they... So I was speaking to someone recently and I was talking... We were talking about promiscuity and I was saying how the... In my opinion that what you just laid out sort of maybe hypergamy there's there's valid reasons for hypergamy and there's valid reasons for men wanting to sleep with multiple women fair enough but i do think that well it's not even i think there's there's quite a lot of data that sort of show that poly, uh, polygamous societies are more destabilized than monogamous societies pretty yeah. much for the exact reason that you just pointed out you get a large percentage of men that don't get any that don't get any female interaction, and you get a large percentage of women that feel disenfranchised, cheated, and abused, and they can't work. I think women are partially blinded by hypergamy a lot of the time, and and it and it there's very yeah, I, I, yeah. So like in that in that example I just gave, right? In that let's say that island, yeah, two or three guys sleeping with seven eight of the women. If you then enforced monogamy, right? I'm not saying we should do this. I'm just saying, as an example, this is the first thing that came to mind. If you enforce monogamy, those two or three guys at the top, they could only then choose one woman, mm. right? They could only then be sexual with one woman. If that happens, then the other women who maybe didn't get the guy that they want, but then they would go back to the pool and then make it work with someone else, right? Because we all want connection. We all want physical intimacy. And then everybody would pair up. And so I think, yeah. And so now I'm not saying that that's what we should do, right? Because there's something that John Peterson said, which I think is valid, is that how do we encourage good behavior without mandating it? Because yeah. mandating it feels tyrannical. That's the key. Right? But we want to guide the behavior that encourages us to live in a social society that is positive for everyone. Um, and so uh, something that you said in terms of... Uh, what did you just say? Was it about, I mean, we, about the not wanting to sort of preclude people from being successful, but also allowing from no? You were talking about you. You were talking about sexual the sexual promiscuity. Oh yes, okay. You said about hypergamy. So yeah. So there's um, there is an instinct in women to want to choose the best male that they can get. Yeah, that is true, right? And there's an instinct in men to to indulge in sexual opportunity, right? Now, what happened is in the past, because of the laws and the rules, we didn't have to exercise discipline with this. Mm. But now we have the freedom and the power, and now we need to, because when we don't, this is what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, for women, it's understanding, and the, the difficult thing is, is that, Part of the reason why sometimes women, some women can be blinded by it is because they can use sex to get access access to guys who wouldn't actually choose them. 
That's very so. A, a woman can a, a woman can offer set free, easy sexual opportunity to a guy who maybe wouldn't never consider her, but because he's a man, he's gonna he's gonna take the sexual opportunity. Yes, yeah. And then what happens is she keeps doing this with guys who she maybe really wants, but wouldn't actually choose her. And she's thinking, oh, I just need to lock one of these guys down. But it's like maybe that guy was never actually on the table for you. Now here's the thing: guys can do this too, right? Guys can use something to try and uh get access to women he would never normally get access to and that's money money time and attention so if a man is maybe he's not that attractive maybe he's not that confident but if he has a lot of money right and he can give a lot of attention he can get access to the kind of woman who maybe would never actually choose him so that's when you get guys who are like oh i'm taking her out i'm spending money on her all of this stuff but she doesn't want to be physically intimate with me and it's like, it's because you're using money, time, and attention to punch above your league, bro. Yes. And women do the same. Some women do the same with sex. They're like, oh, I'm being intimate with these guys, all of this stuff. You know, like, why don't they want me? And it's like, because you're using sex to punch above your league. Yeah. I, I, a man I, having sex with you as a woman is not him choosing you. That's indulgence for him. It's not a choice in you. Yes. Yes. I, I, and I think, and, and that's that's part of the work that I do, teach women that. So understanding the real options is the guy who's actually investing in you seriously. That's the guy that is available to you. Not the guy who's going to invite you over at 11 p.m. and then send you off the, in the morning. You can't think that's a guy choosing you. No. You know what I mean? I do, yeah. And but I suppose some women may be, women may be comfortable to be shared. They might they would rather have 10% of this guy, 10% of man X than they would have 100% of man Y. Although I think that's a, a thing that a young young women tend to be more full victim to because they haven't matured properly and they realize actually this isn't worthwhile. And and just the, the, the point that you made where you were just talking about it when you said that men give... Um, sexual access to women who they wouldn't choose i saw a, a video on your instagram which i thought was really i'd never thought of it like that the difference between wanting and and choosing i really i really liked um when you you spoke about that and the point i was i was just making was they're both the sort of slightly manipulative so or so the men with money are getting attention they're giving attention which is I think that's the primary currency that women work in. Attention is what they're fundamentally after. Um, the, 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 what would you say? The sort of sexual intimacy or maybe sexual activity, not intimacy, because that is part of attention. But the sexual activity is a, is, is secondary to their desire for attention. And then where, and then maybe with men, it's the other way around, which is obviously why dating apps and, and social media and things like that are massively inflating some people's egos and deflating other people's egos in, I would say in an inaccurate manner because of the medium that, that we have that we have nowadays um, yeah 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 what so, so talk about that um, wanting choosing thing what what does that mean yeah sure uh so when i talk about this this is uh, usually referring for women because i i do coach men but i primarily coach women i have yeah. primarily coach women um and this is understanding the difference between a man wanting you and choosing you a man wanting you is him wanting to be sexually physical with you right he's desiring you in a physical way yeah. that is not him choosing you a man choosing you is he's intentional with you. He shows up for you in the way that he says he was. He gives you his time and attention. He gives you his non-sexual attention. Yes. That's how men vet. A man, you going over to a man's house as a woman and being physical with him, that is not him investing in you. No. But you go no. for lunch with a man, right? It's the opposite. It's him indul it's, it, it's indulgence. It's indulgence, yeah. Right. But you go for a walk with a guy for a couple of hours when you're talking about different things in your life experiences, you talk about books that you've read before, you know, you're actually getting to know each other, right? That non-sexual attention, that is him investing in you. Mm. 
very good. That is him actually choosing you because he's not spending time with you because there's sexual opportunity. He's spending time because he's choosing who you are. Yeah. Because the reality is for a lot of guys, a lot of guys, they will have sex with anything. Yes. Like for guys, it's, it's, it doesn't sound nice, but for guys, it's like going to the gym. It's like you go work up a sweat, you release endorphins, you feel good, and then you leave. You don't even think about it. Yeah. So when you understand this as a woman, understanding the difference between a man wanting you and a man choosing you, that's going to, that's going to drastically shift and give you understanding and clarity on the men who you may get involved with or are even currently involved with. Hmm. And you're right about, you know, for some women, they'd rather have 10% of the guy they want than 90% of the guy who's second or third choice. But I think that's to do with what stage of life she's at. Yeah, if she gets to a point it. or when she gets to a point that she wants to settle down, that's ten, that, that tends to switch. And that tends to happen between the ages, like between 28 and 32 for most women. That's when that switch tends to happen. 28 and 32, that's nuts. Yeah, they call it the... um. They call it the epiphany phase. The epiphany phase. Have you heard of that? No. It's it's just it's like a change of stage in her mindset into in in regards to the kind of man she's looking for if she hasn't found the kind of guy that she wants. Wow. Or I should say, or she hasn't gotten serious commitment and security with the guy that she wants. Yeah. But that is, I feel like that isn't spoken enough because that is. You, you you mentioned earlier how do you sort out the, the problem of the the inequitable dating market and you said well it's uh no sex before marriage aka sort of sort of semi force force mon monogamy yeah i mean i'm not saying that's what we should do i'm saying no, that no, i don't no. i'm not saying that <laughs> yeah no it will, it will solve the, problem. the horse has bolted and also there then there needs to be then that's too uh sort of restrictive that that ide ideology there needs to be more freedom but we we we're currently in a in a slightly more of a the so, pendulum has swung back the other way so here's what we could do that would work okay every woman said i'm not going to be physically intimate with you unless we're in a committed relationship that would solve the problem yes which is basically, it's kind of like the whole no sex before marriage, but it's more freedom. Yes. Right? Yes. But this is this is guiding behavior, not enforcing it. Mm. Smaller time. But, ev but every woman has to do this because thing is, you have women who are great women who don't get the relationship with great guys because there's two or three other girls who are offering easy sexual opportunity mm. and you get to spread it. Yeah. And so then she has to, in order for him to choose her without that physical intimacy she has to bring so much value in other ways yes or she has to um she has to betray her own self-worth and she has to become someone that she, she doesn't want she has to become someone that she doesn't want to be and do something she doesn't want to do in order to compete yeah That's yeah it's it. like if, if you're a woman and you have you know one guy's like hey you know, I don't want to take you out properly yet. I want to have a coffee and get to know you first. But there's three other attractive guys who's like, hey, let's go for dinner. Let's go to the Shard or whatever. Mm. It's pretty obvious who she's going to at least choose, right, initially. Because she doesn't know any of these guys. So she's going to choose you know, what she feels is the is the best opportunity and experience for what she wants, which is attention. Attention. Yeah, sort of desire. Attention from a desired, attention from a desired person, yeah. These, when you look at something like marriage and you look at the way that people used to get married young, what, what you're, you're getting, you're creating a generation of young women now that are quasi traumatized because of relationships that they've been in with when they're young. And yes, and that is then massively, what you don't understand is when you're in a relationship with someone, and this is textbook sort of narcissistic masculine behavior and maybe feminine as well. If you misuse that person, you don't just damage them. You damage their capacity to have you. You damage their ability to have future future engagements in the future, and that in turn is damaging. Not damaging. That's sort of limiting the potential of other people's relationships. 
And I understand that, you know, people, let's be honest, Ollie, no one's going to, people don't think like that. And, you know, that's just the world we live in and, and there's there's reasons for that, etc. But you are sort of, you know, I, I speak to, as, as I'm sure you have, every single woman that I've spoken to on this podcast, and I've done over 50 episodes and probably predominantly women to be fair and fair enough maybe it's not a, a balanced sample but they all say I just wait for it to happen I was in a toxic relationship I wasn't being treated right da, 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 da. and it's I I genuinely think it's kind of like the it's in the sort of female existential code that they have to go through this process because maybe it can or maybe or maybe they don't have to but they have a, a desire when they're young to be drawn towards certain types of men, which is well documented in psychology. And then they have to maybe reconfigure themselves as a result of that experience. And maybe it's part of, in the same way that maybe the masculine sort of story would be to, you know, like the hero's journey to go out and, and conquer chaos and, and you know, slay slay the dragon maybe there's some sort of story but it, it really does sort of amaze me and, and and when I combine that with like ideas of oppressive patriarchy and toxic masculinity and all men are bastards and I think well how has no one sort of put these two things together and gone maybe there's a link between these things and do you understand what I mean how I, I do yeah I I, I actually think there's something else as to why this happens. Okay. It's not every woman. Give it to me. Um, but it, those women are the loudest because, you know, they've, they've, if they're single and they want a relationship, it's not happening for them. So it makes sense to seem like that's all the noise, but it, it's not, it's not as big of the population as we may think. Okay. I think two, I think two reasons. The first reason is that back in the day, young women would have, guidance on the kind of man to choose and they would usually have guidance from a masculine role so that would either be their father their brother their uncle their granddad wow. right they would have guidance on this is what a good man is now they don't have that or if they do they reject it they have the opposite in fact right and the other thing is that they are encouraged to date in a way that is masculine that appeals to the masculine nature, which is be sexually free, which is to, you know, like, for example, if a woman has sex with a guy on a one night stand and kicks him out of the house, sends him in an Uber home, that's empowering for her. What? Why? What? Why is that now? Why is that the narrative now? Yeah. It's like, it's like we're, we're encouraging women to. Andrew Schultz made this skit, right? He says, um, he says, uh, like, for, like, you know, very strong sexually liberal feminists, for example. He's like, okay. Yeah. He's like, well, you want to, you know, walk around with your boobs out. It's like, okay, yeah, cool. You, you do that. You want to have sex without commitment. Okay, yeah, cool. You do that. You want to, you know, basically, if you get pregnant, you want to have an abortion so you don't have to take responsibility for the child. Okay, great. So, basically, you want to become the fuck boys that you complain about because that's what they do. That's exactly yeah. what they do. They walk around as if to invite sexual opportunity. They have sex with women without commitment, right? And if she gets pregnant, he doesn't want to take responsibility for it. Yeah. So it's like they're encouraged to act in the masculine way that they that they detest in men. That they detest. And they're told it's empowering. Brilliant. And the issue is most, look, we, we all are comprised of masculine and feminine. Yeah. Right? All of us, because we're more bastard, right? We're human beings. But most of us have either a more masculine core or we have a more feminine core. Yeah. Right? As in we are we tend to have a core that tends to be sits more in our masculine or more in our feminine. Generally speaking, most women tend to have a more feminine core, and most men tend to have a more masculine core. Are there men who have a feminine core? Yes. Are there women who have a masculine core? Yes. This is generally speaking. Right, it's probably the eighty twenty rule again, right? And eighty percent of women. If you have a more feminine core, and you are trying to operate something that is supposed to be fulfilling for the feminine in a masculine way, that is going to scar you. 
It's going to scar that feminine core in you. And then what happens is that you don't know what it's like to be attracted to healthy, so you attract these toxic relationships. Because when I've talked to some people, they say, oh, I was in this toxic relationship. I'm like, how long were you in that for? They're like two, three years. I'm like, why, how, why are you in it for so long? Yeah. When you operate from a place of, when you operate from a healthy place, you are attracted to healthy. When you're operating from an unhealed place, a broken place, you are attracted to broken and toxic. Yeah. So you, so, and don't get me wrong, this isn't me saying that if somebody mistreats you, right, that, that's on them, right? That's their behavior. Of course, of course. But for me personally, and I'm just going to be completely honest with you, I've come across and dated very, very attractive women who were toxic, and that's why I didn't go anywhere. Yeah. I'd have dated women who were incredibly attractive, who were healthy, and then we got into a relationship. Yeah. So if she's if she if if I'm operating from a healthy place, somebody who is healthy is attractive to me. Yeah. So it's like as you know, I say this to the women I work with. If imagine this, right? Imagine if out of a hundred percent your attraction to a guy has to be 80% in order for you to be like, I want this, right? 80% is the bar. Now, what can happen is he may be tall, attractive, successful. So he's like, okay, that is 90%. So I'm in it now, right? If he doesn't treat you well, that 90% should go to 60% in which he doesn't make the cut anymore. Yeah. That's really, really good. I like Equally, that. Equally, yeah, drop down. Right? Equally, you may meet a guy that on just initially, you're like, maybe he's like 65%. So he's got some good qualities about him, but I'm, you're not super attracted to him that you want to choose him right now. But then he shows up for you in ways. He's considerate of you. He makes you feel safe, makes you feel seen. Provides a frame for you to be the woman that you want to be. That 65% should go to 90 and be like, this is the man I want to choose. Yeah. When you're operating from a healthy place, someone who treats you well makes them more attractive. Yes. And if someone who treats you badly makes them less attractive, what was happening, I think it happened for a lot of women when they're operating from a broken place, is the guy who was 90% initially, right? He treats her badly and she goes, yeah, but he's 90%, so I'm going to stay. Yeah. Well, I, th I, I think it's, it's, I, I think it's, it's even more sort of pathological than that. I think, human beings have a psychological configuration which is that if we talk about female hypergamy if you treat something like it's a lesser thing than you you are by definition higher than they are so what that means is is that when someone is, when you when someone treats you badly maybe maybe that's a more sort of female thing to do because they're stereotypically more sub submissive and chaos is I don't know it's encapsulated of that but if you treat someone poorly you are in a very sick twisted way I guess maybe from a primal perspective not from an experienced mature perspective you're you're displaying signs of sort of uh higher status and I think that's part of the reason why one of the reasons why women stay in relationships with men that, that treat them badly because and you if you're coming from a, a broken perspective a broken woman is possibly one woman that doesn't feel safe and because a woman's in my opinion a woman's priority is to feel safe and secure as in that is that is their that's the crux of the the feminine it, it feels it feels very vulnerable because it is very vulnerable and it's and it wants to feel safe and when they're with someone who maybe they treat them awfully but in the in somewhere in their mind goes okay i'm with a monster but he could be my monster and he can protect me from all the other monsters out there and yes i have this this is my monster that i'm with and i think that yes and you, you 
in a way you can't almost knock that because there is actually truth to that and uh, you know i i have what, what do you think about that do, do, does that make sense to you i completely agree with you women women don't choose based on morality they choose on capability absolutely yeah like instinctually mm. they would rather choose the guy who's not that nice but is very capable than the guy who's very nice but is not capable completely which is why you know this is why when girls say oh i just want a nice guy and i'm like guys don't listen to it it's not true it's yeah. not that she doesn't want a guy who's not good to her what she's what she's what she's missing out is she wants a capable man who's going to be good to her that's what she's saying yes she's not saying she wants a guy who's nice no. because here's the thing and women will test you as a man they naturally will do it because and the reason they will test you is because if you can't stand up to her how can she trust you to stand up for completely yeah because they want to feel secure yeah so you are much so if you're a man you are much more likely to attract women by showing that you're capable than showing that you're nice i'm not saying you shouldn't be nice but that's not the attraction trigger that's not the arousal trigger no no there's um there's I met this is narrative. It's the order and sometimes it's it's you know Beauty and the Beast, right? Have you seen the film Beauty and the Beast? So uh, yes. It yeah, it follows that follows the archetypal story of attraction. So Beast to start off with is a sort of a raging, lunatic, cantankerous, dangerous, aggressive, nuts and but Belle contends with the beast because she's a strong yeah. woman, and 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 inside every woman is a, a you know a force of nature because women are nature. They they encapsulate. That's what's so complicated about femininity. It's that femininity is, in my opinion, far more diverse than masculinity. If you imagine masculinity is like this core, like, and then femininity is all this energy that sort of floats around it, and it's but and masculinity is just this femininity is this it's, it's so vast you've got Belle and the Beast and they're contending with each other and and they're sort of you know he's being exceptionally loud and, and rude and you know sort of nuts but then later on he the, he has a moment where he's like quite quiet and he's this is where the whole talk of vulnerability comes in because if you watch something like the Fresh and Fit podcast or whatever they'll say They'll get a load of sort of women on and they'll go, oh, vulnerability's great. I love vulnerability. And then men will go, no, you don't. You'll, you'll use it against a man at a weakened state. And I think vulnerability is a key part of the sort of the attraction ritual. Sorry, that might be me. Um, but it has to be tampered or tempered with sort of countervailing attributes do you understand what i mean I, th I think one of the reasons why being like muscular is so beneficial because when a woman sees a man or tall as well i guess is it sort of slightly different but when a woman sees a man who's tall and a muscular it immediately sends that message of danger this guy's capable so you 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 jump over that first hurdle which is to show your more dominant side and therefore yes you can then you don't have to be like an asshole to them because as as much maybe it's all a balance of like the primal protective drive that they or necessity that they have and like because you can be with as i said you can be with a monster but if that monster is going to bloody like going to ruin you then it's not worth it. So it's all tempering, but you've got to find that strike that balance. And I think you said earlier, you said that young women don't have any advice on to how to find that balance. And I think they they almost have the opposite. Like I was at Reading Festival a couple of years ago. Um and what's her face? I think it was Megan the Stallion. And she was there like with all these young sort of sixteen, eighteen year olds and she was like y'all ready to have a hot girl summer and they were like yeah and i was just thinking what i mean this is like this is just as bad as supposedly what the man from romania has been 
talking about in recent years this is it's just on the other side of the spectrum um i i, I you can't say his name anymore i don't think you get but he is taken down immediately um but yeah, i i i hit i definitely hear what you're saying yeah go it's no 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 i i i just think um I really, I really, really liked. I'd never ever thought of that idea when you said that young women had advice from men as to what to choose to look out for in other men. I've never thought they've, of it like that. They've always had masculine guidance to to choose a good man. Because when you're young, like, what do you, what do you know? Exactly. Then it's the same. Like, you can say that's why we're, back in the back in the day, like as a guy, you would choose a woman and you would introduce her to your mother, and your mother would say yes or no. Yes. Like, like when you're young, like what do you know? No, exactly. And we and we've got we for some reason we have this culture of rejecting everything that happened historically and traditionally. Now there were some things traditionally that yeah didn't serve us and was bad, but there's something that was really good. Completely. And there's there's wisdom in that that we should be taking forward. But now it's like now nah, we're just going to reject everything. It's like you're kind of throwing the baby out of the bathwater. Absolutely. And the thing is, like, and you know what you're saying about being vulnerable, you know, like fresh air. I think that's such toxic advice for guys. It is. It's not that as a you can't be vulnerable. It's that you have to earn it with her. If you are too vulnerable too soon, that's when it works against you. I love that. You have to earn it. Very yeah. good. She has to be. She has to be. There's a point where she has to be. She has to be so. When I say falling for you, I don't mean in love with in love with you, yeah. but she has to be for who you are as a guy. That yeah. being vulnerable then enhances and deepens that connection. It's the same thing with women and sex, right? It's not that women shouldn't be physical with guys; they shouldn't have sex with guys. It's that if you do it when he when it hasn't been earned, he's going to associate you with as being easy, and you're not gonna. It's not going to go anywhere serious. Yeah. But when you do it at the right point where there's a level of emotional investment from him and then you have sex, that's not just then casual. It's that intimacy then deepens the connection you both have. So it's not that men shouldn't be vulnerable with women, right? It's that it ha he has to earn that level of vulnerability and it's about building the trust. You know, women have to build trust with a guy before he, she's physically intimate with him and men need to, be tr need to build trust with a woman. And you choose the right woman to be vulnerable with. Just like women, choose the right guy to be physical with. Yes. Because with the wrong woman, yeah, she will use it against you. And and that's on her, right? That's on her. But then as a guy, it's like, okay, it's understanding how do I know that this is a woman that I can be vulnerable with? And that's what makes the difference. Because like, Because being vulnerable for both people deepens connection. And that's what we're all here for. Yeah. You know what I mean? It does, yeah. It does deepen connection. What when you? What's your sort of? What do you find? Sorry, we'll we'll we'll, we'll close up soon. I, I really appreciate. It. I've loved easy, man. I'm I'm easy. I'm easy. I was okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, then if yeah, so you you mentioned the um. You were just talking about the, or I said that women may use your vulnerability against you, and there's. It's kind of like a serpentile sort of aspect to that. It's sort of deceptive and it's a great sort of a good example of we've, as a society, we've correct, correctly, well, we're always in the process of it, but we're, we're clamping down more on, if you imagine like male pathology or masculine pathology is kind of like a lion it's yeah. there it's brash it's in your face it's gonna it's gonna metaphorically rip you to pieces but then you imagine female pathology is like a snake you it's you can't see it it's it's very i i i really think that women have some of the best pr in the world because i meet and know of so many just awful women that are so worse than almost any man i've ever met and i think no one nowhere in society is it spoken about just how other than and obviously women i mean women know about it because a lot of the time women aren't even friends with people in their own friendship group they don't even like them and i and and i i, I 
I don't know what I think because that's why women are so suspect about the women when they're in a relationship with a man because they know of women. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so it, it's it it sort of it needs to be. No, no, yeah, you said you were religious in 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 the in the Garden of Eden when Eve takes the apple. Who is it that tells her to take the apple? Yeah, it's a snake. Yeah, and it and it no. Eve that Eve takes the apple. It's not Adam. Um, You're right. The ma- the masculine is like a line. It's direct. It's in your face. The 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 what I should say is. The dark masculine is like a is like a ferocious, aggressive lion. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. The the dark feminine is a snake. Completely. And that's why in the Bible it was the snake that led Eve to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, exactly. it's what the It's a um a, a, so I think from a sort of mythological point of view, you've got like a mermaid. And and what is a mermaid? A mermaid what was a mermaid? It was an exceptionally beautiful woman that would lure men into the water and then devour them. And the, the, there's the, the great, the sort of the best articulate artic or what would you say? Um, visual representation of it is in the Pirates of the Caribbean film where all these mermaids surround them and they're like, Oh my goodness me, they're so beautiful. And they're sort of the, they're, struck by literally in like in the jungle book isn't it Mowgli is uh hypnotized by the snake's eyes because it um that that's what happens and and there's sort of the the alluring drawing in nature of the of the feminine and and that can be exceptionally positive and loving and the warm embrace but can it also be devouring in the same way that that Freud spoke about the the devour I think it's Freud spoke about the devouring mother and just how how damaging the the all the it's so it's kind of slightly different the what would you say the over loving mother is can be exceptionally dangerous but then you've also got like a condition like we'll go and way off but you've got something like Munchausen by proxy which is do you know what that is no what is that so that's when so Munchausen is a condition where you make yourself ill in order to garner attention and sympathy from other people. And Munchausen by proxy is when parents do it to their children. True, truly, it's absolutely awful. And, you know, Munchausen by proxy is basically something that mothers do. You do, you, because I've worked in education for a bit, you very, very rarely get fathers that are um, sort of, uh, transgressing in that way it's a it's a it's a much as my property it's that so hansel and gretel it's a devouring mother it's it's a tangled with the mum that wants to use the daughter to stay youthful it's very it's exceptionally manipulative and it is like a serpent and it, it's um yeah oh the, there was one other little thing um you earlier you were talking about the percentage i've tried to find this study but I can't find it, so it may be rubbish. But apparently they did the study where they took a group of men and they took a group of women and they said to them, right, you could have your you could have eighty percent your perfect person. And all the men said, Yeah, that's I would that's fucking fine with me. And all pretty much all the women said, No, that's settling. I'm not doing that. I want a hundred percent or I want ninety percent. And and I think that's got to be true. Do you think there's, I mean, I can't find it. I don't know where it is. Maybe it's not a proper study, in which case it has no validity. But you can imagine that there's probably some truth to that, can't you? I I fully believe that's true, for sure. And and But there's reasons why it's true. Yes. Because women have abundance. They start with abundance. So if, if you have abundance, why would you compromise? Yes. Men start with lack. Yes. They start with lack. Like they say there's nothing. I think this was Winston Churchill's time. We're talking about war, right? There is nothing more valuable in society than a young woman. So While true. we've had patriarchal societies, every society across the globe has always protected its young women they send their their 
men, young and old, off to war to protect the young women and children. Amen. How many? I was going to say, there is. they say there is nothing more useless than a young man because he has nothing to offer. He has no experience. He has no mastery of skills. He has no leadership qualities. Like he has nothing of value to offer. Now, as men, we start with lack. So you, if we start with nothing, you're going to give us 80%. Of course, we're going to take it. Yes. Yeah. But as a woman, if you start with abundance and says, hey, you know, here's 80%, you're going to be like, no. Why? Yeah. But that changes over the time. Literally, yeah. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's why I sort of turn it onto a morbid subject. It's why there are thousands and thousands of young men that are killing themselves every year and no one is talking about it. And it just, it blows my mind. It's like, if this amount of young women were killing themselves, there would be right. riots in the street. It would be everywhere. But it's because you, you, because you, young women, I, I did a blog post on it. Young women are, um, oh, what's the word? Well, young men are expendable and young women are, I don't know what the word is, but it, they're exceptionally, they need to be protected. Um, yeah, like I, I, I don't even mean to, you know, bring the whole racing into this, but like black people in the West being brutalized by authorities has always happened. Who is the white woman who got killed by a police officer within the last couple of years in in UK? Yeah, um, and... Dwayne Cousins, wasn't it? The the the, the Sarah Everard. Okay, okay. Sarah Everard. Sarah, Sarah Everard. When was the last time that a white female in this country was brutalized by police? I can't even remember. Happens once, whole protest. Yeah. <laughs> of course, women are protected. When it happens to guys, it's like, oh, it's a shame. We literally heard the other day, a, another boy got stabbed. I'm in London. So, like, we hear yeah, we... it. When it happens to guys, it's kind of like, okay, yo, that's such a shame. We do change, whatever. But it, it happens to a woman. Everyone's in arms. Everyone is in awe. And it's funny because people don't like to acknowledge it, but it's, it's just the way that, you know, it's the way it is. No, it's true. I mean, I think five-year-old me watched the Titanic and sort of nailed the whole feminism. I mean, obviously not. I'm being exceptionally um, facile here. But I remember asking my mum and dad being like, why does why are they saying women and children on first? And why are they letting the men stay on the ship and die? And, um, yeah. With... and you know, that's it. Five-year-old me could work it out from watching a film. So... Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um it's one it's it's one of those things where I'm not saying that that necessarily could should change, in a sense of women and children shouldn't be protected first. No, I'm not. And I was raised in, I was raised in Nigerian household, so culturally there are things that are quite traditional about me culturally. Yeah. Right? So I'm not saying that should change. However. You can't have, you can't give, for example, you can't give me the responsibility to protect you, but there isn't a level of authority there. Yeah. Because responsibility without authority is slavery. Yeah. But I tell you to go up, go on. Well, you know, they're spot on, but it, it's even more, it's more, even more pathologically twisted than that. The, the desire that men have to protect and care for women has been twisted so that it's only oppression and men they don't have any i desire for care they just want to control and uh, control and oppress i think it's been maligned in such in such a way um it's even deeper than that but yes you're, you're spot on so c carry on sorry to interrupt well yeah no i no that's all right I, I i i agree with you i think partly of that is because many women have had bad experiences with men yeah you're right and that is valid so yeah and valid it's and partly is because unfortunately some experiences but partly because they've not had the right guidance um and so when they've come across a guy who exhibits the attractive qualities that she may not even know why she's choosing him because he's capable because he can provide security because he can make or he mimics they the wrong 
yes but then you choose the wrong kind of guy who abuses that you're going to go oh well guys who want to have a level of authority with it or responsibility within the relationship is bad and that's and then that's the narrative of, well you can't rely on a man you better go out there and become that strong independent boss babe because mm-hmm. you can never rely on a man yeah but it's like the happiest this is just from my experience the happiest women are the women who let the man take the responsibility but it's a good man who serves the relationship yes because the feminine submits to the masculine but the masculine serves the feminine yes that's pretty good the feminine and when you i've not tightened my go to experience i i have never seen when i've seen that dynamic i've never seen it that dynamic where at least i'm primarily work with women where she is not happy i've never seen it i've never seen a woman where who's with a man that she trusts she's with a man who is capable who provides security while he might have a level of authority with the relationship he uses it to serve the relationship and that's from my experience that's what the feminine wants 